Um, I'm sure that there's something for each and every one of us uh, here where we can learn from. But I'll be calling on, you know, my panelists shortly. Um, I'll read their bios and invite them on stage. Please, when I call them out, you guys should just uh, help me to give them a warm welcome, give them energy, because when you give them energy and you welcome them, it will be easier for them to spill the beans and tell you secrets of how they've become you know, successful in their endeavors, especially building leadership and management skills, which I'm sure all of you need, whether as a student, whether as a business owner, whether as a creative. Um, first, I'm going to be calling on um, someone who is popularly known as the style infidel. He's a Nigerian fashion stylist who is managed by few visionary. He is none other than the, than the one and only Tosin Oguda Digbe. Please put your hands together for him. This man has styled some of the biggest stars in this country, including myself. But I'm just grateful that he does not dress me like himself because there are some things Tosin will wear. I'll just be like, please, dear, this one you're wearing, don't give me to wear. But good to have you. Please have a seat. Thank you. Now, the next person I'm going to be calling is someone who is a friend of mine. I've known her for a couple of years. She's a lifestyle blogger and vlogger living in Lagos, Nigeria. She's a full-time content creator and she aims to explore life and share and inspire her life's journey through posts and her experiences. Please help me welcome the Beyonce of YouTube, Dina, Dima Ume. Please put your hands together for her. Our beauty, lifestyle, fashion queen. <laughs> oh, by the way, congratulations are in order. You guys, I'm sure you people have heard the news, but she, she's engaged and she's marrying soon. Please put your hands together for her. Greet our Olga for us. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Now, let me take the time to also invite on stage someone who, from a very, very early stage, developed a passion for fashion. Um, she's grown up to be one of the biggest, well-known, you know, couture designers in Nigeria. She has styled the biggest stars. And before Instagram became a thing, she, her name and her brand was already ringing on social media. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome none other than the one and only Toju Foye. Please put your hands together for her. You're welcome, Toju. Sorry about that. Awesome. Hi, how are you? <laughs> All right. Now, this next panelist is already online. He's going to be joining us on screen via the virtual live, virtual screens. Please help me welcome someone who is a business strategist and provides strategic advice and consulting for top organizations. He's helped his clients generate a revenue of more than $45 million. He's also a business coach and author. His books have sold over 30,000 copies in various platforms. Please help me give a warm, great, amazing welcome um, to Steve Harris. Please put your hands together for Steve Harris. He's already online right now joining us on the screen. Thank you, Steve, for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, finally, I'd like to invite on stage a representative of Providus Bank. Please help me welcome the head exports and business from Providus Bank, Abiodun Ario. Please put your hands together for him. Thank you, Abiodun, for joining us here today. Awesome. All right, so guys, all of you have your mics. Say tutu, tutu. <laughs> oh, Tosin, you're too fresh for tutu. <laughs> all right, today we're going to be starting with 
you know, a topic which I believe each and every one of us um, have um, contributions and a lot of wealth of experience to share from. And, you know, we, we're all here to learn. We're going to be talking about strengthening leadership and management abilities. When I look at all of us here, I see Tosin, uh, top stylist. I see Dima, <clears throat> you know, um, the Beyonce of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I see Tojo Foyer, the queen of, you know, fashion. And I see, you know, Steve Harris, king of, you know, management and leadership. And then, of course, Abiodun, who is also, you know, the head of, you know, um, exports, which is business in, you know, the corporate sector, in the bank and finance. So I believe that each and every one of us have diverse experiences, you know, um, but we can all learn from your shared experiences and how you have been able to use um, your or grow your leadership skill and management skill in your business and in your enterprise. But let me first start out by, you know, um, asking Dima. Dima, I know you don't like me to start with you first. <laughs> so you're just like, God, let him not call my name first. But, you know, you started out as a YouTuber. Um, and I'm sure, you know, when you started out, you just put a camera in front of your face and then, you know, you just started doing what you were doing. How did you evolve as, you know, a content creator to when you knew that you had to develop the skill of leadership and management and how you put that in your business and, you know, how it influenced your business to grow? Because I'm sure that later on, because I, I also, you know, double in the you know, content creation space. And so I know that at, at first, you're just like, let me just create content and put out. But later on, if you want to scale and grow, you need to learn leadership. So how, how did that, you know, influence your business and your, your journey? Um, one thing I like to say is that, like a lot of people just generally don't understand how much work goes into content creation. So what happens is just like you said, like you just want to create content online, you start out, it's cute. And then I think for people who take that route, once you start creating, you begin to realize that there's more to this. Maybe at first it starts out with, oh, there's, there's actually possibly money to be made here. And then when you think about that or when that becomes obvious, you now begin to think of, oh, all the aspects of it that have to come together for it to be a proper revenue generating business. And then you realize, oh, I have to be consistent. Um, I have to fine tune this skill and that skill. I have to show up whether or not I want to. I feel like that's your first wake up call you realize that you're just not doing something casually, right? And I feel like, first of all, you begin to effectively manage yourself, you manage your time, you begin to manage the resources that you have, just to ensure that you're properly maximizing all of that. And then I think that with YouTube, as time goes, you grow. So for me, about four or five years ago, I got to a point where I became, like I wanted to put out more videos and I, like, I started out by posting maybe two videos a month, and then you gradually go to about four videos a month, and then you get to a point where you realize that, oh, if you're doing two, three videos a month, a week, actually, the algor algorithm rewards you. And then you realize at a point that, okay, like if you're actually going to do this, maintain a certain type of quality, there is no way for you to be all of this at once. Most content creators you see on platforms like YouTube, you're your own script writer, you're your own videographer, you're your own editor. So you, you record, you edit, and then there's a whole administrative aspect where you have to generate invoices, you have to submit things for approval. So the more you go, you realize that I can actually, like if I want to actually maintain quality, because you get to a point where it's either the quality gives, for me quality is such a big thing, and I got to a point where I realized that I have to outsource. Right. And then you start outsourcing, um, people, other people come into the mix. Then you have to manage those people <laughs> alongside managing yourself. You begin to just like learn like just things that actually help with performance. Like I got to a point where I remember like I had this employee where I realized like for some reason she was struggling more than others. And I got to a point where I actually realized that 
she really thrived when you would praise her. Like words of affirmation were so big to her. And like when you're giving a lot of like direct like criticism, all of that, like you begin to realize that, okay, the way I receive information is not the way another person possibly would want to receive it and perform at their best. So it's it's a learning thing you do. You like mm -hmm. you get to a point you realize like for me though, some people get into these type of situations already prepared. For me, it was me coming to stages doing a whole lot of like Yeah, you grew yeah, on the job and yeah, learned. Yeah, and it. then you realize, yeah, I need to learn how to do this, I need to maximize this, I right. need to learn this. So right. I grew on the job. What you're saying is very important, you know, because people don't understand that even when you're starting out as a creative, mm -hmm. you have to use leadership skills in yeah. discipline, planning, yeah. you know, and all of those things. Now, yeah. between, um, you know, being, having those skills or, you know, having leadership skills by yourself when you were alone and then when you got a team, which is easier? Yeah. Was it easier to manage when it was just yourself or when you got a team that you began to, you know, manage other people? Hmm, that's actually a very good question. Um, I would say definitely managing other people. Like, I feel like for me, yeah. that was the more <laughs> difficult one. Because if you don't have, like, results, you can only blame yourself. Yeah. But if you if you have a team, then you can always keep people on time yeah. and say, yo. And even, like, especially with things like editing, the feedback has to be very specific. You use timestamps. You explain a bunch of things, and you have to be a good communicator. When you're leading yourself, you're like you're talking to yourself. So you have to develop skills that you didn't even think that outside of talking to the camera, you realize that you have to learn to talk to people. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So Tosi, um, I mean, I would like to hear a story from you. You know, because I know that you <laughs> like to give stories, <laughs> but. Can you share a pivotal moment in your career where you had to demonstrate strong leadership qualities and, you know, maybe a management skill? And, you know, um, can you just share with us that experience so we can learn from it? Um, where do I start from? <laughs> okay, I would um, use having a client who we sort of like did our very best to make her happy. I mean, the reason why you would employ people is to take away the stress from you. You just probably focus on the creative part of the work and you have a team who communicates, who um, develops mood boards and all of that. And at the end of the day, the client is not pleased. And at that point, myself, my manager who is here had to step in to sort of like um, communicate with them and let them know, oh, we're so sorry, this, 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 this and that. And I will tell you the honest truth. Like Dima said, it is so difficult when it comes to having managing a team. If it's you, if there's a flop somewhere, you take the responsibility. But when you know you have a team and there's still a flop somewhere, it comes back to you. Your name is on the masthead. So we've had situations like that where effective communication really helped, has helped. And also like testament from like previous clients has helped that, oh, something went wrong somewhere and, but I'm very sure they will tidy it up. And of course the team always ties it, tidies it up. Mm -hmm. But in the real sense of it, it happens, especially in this space we're in now. As you grow your brand and as you grow bigger, the challenges become bigger. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's, that's If there's that. anything I'm hearing repetitively from the both of you, it's effective communication, especially when you're dealing with people. Told you, have you had to, you know, learn how to effectively communicate? Or it just came with a package. You were like, look, <laughs> no. I am told you for yeah. No, no. <laughs> This isn't very loud. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. <sighs> Honestly, with regards to communication, it's kind of like what Tosin said. Mine is a bit more, I would say difficult, because you're dealing with both customers and staff. Mm. And what I do right. for the most part is bespoke. I'm tailor making an outfit for you. Right. So if I start from the customer right. standpoint, with regards to communicating, right? Yes. Like in terms yes. of yes. Yes. So what was your question again? You wanted so, to know exactly how to Yes, have you had to me? grow with communication skills or you Yes. Know. Thank you. I just wanted to be reminded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yes, with regards to customers, I think it's from the big it was very hard in the beginning. Because as a creative you put your heart and your soul into what you're doing from right. the start. That's yes. what gives you pleasure. But it's not about yourself. It's about the client who is paying. So if I give you a classic example, you have a customer who comes in and says, Oh, I want this dress. And you're a creative looking at this person thinking, oh, this isn't what I think will best suit you. Mm. 
I think maybe this will suit you. And you know, they're adamant on whatever it is that they came in for. So communicating, I've had to learn to communicate in those type of situations where you're like, okay, you know what, this is what you want, however, this is what I think suits you best. But being able to manage that. So giving almost like compromising, making sure that, okay, I'm part of my work at the end of the day. Right. And this customer is also happy. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect of dealing with customers I've had to learn on the job. Another aspect is dealing with criticism. The hardest part as a creative, as you yes. can imagine. Yes. This is the hardest part. Um, but with regards to that, I'm very open to criticism as long as it's constructive. Because, and I, you know, I realize that, you know, when someone's coming and they're yelling and whatever, and I do the same thing with my staff, for example, where they haven't done something that I want and I'm yelling, I realize that that doesn't really work. So the way it doesn't work for me is the way it wouldn't work for my staff if I'm yelling at them without making them understand what they've actually done wrong. So half the time when I have, I'm in a situation where a customer comes and is yelling or whatever, I'm like, I try to calm them down just to understand the actual problem and also understand how I could have done things better. And once I do that, of course, I apologize. I try and make it up and all of that. And I decide to take the same approach with my staff. So as opposed to yelling or whatever, I would make them understand exactly what they've done wrong. And also over time, just from my own experience, I've now tried to even take it a step further with my staff, which is by teaching them. So if we've made a mistake, so for example, we have brides on the weekend. And so on Monday, we're like, okay, what are the mistakes from last week? Okay, so we didn't do this, we didn't do that. And we write it down. And we're like, okay, so this is what we need to do for next time. So I take notes and I say, okay, this particular tailor, okay, maybe his finishing needs to always be double checked or whatever. So before even mm. handing it off to the client, you also put processes we will in now, place. Yeah. Yes, processes in place. And then we would then go to the tailor who has a finishing problem and say, okay, where is your list of things that you're supposed to do before you check something off? You mm -hmm. know, so it's just little things like that I've learned um, on the job. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that, Toju. Um, Abiyadu, when Toju was speaking, she talked about, you know, sometimes when there are disagreements, you know, between her and a client or, you know, and communicating that or, you know, trying to pass across how, um, you know, what she feels best or now uh, you're heading the export department in your bank and I'm sure that you have a team. Um, so how do you handle conflicts or disagreements within your team and even with external teams? You know, what techniques um, have you found most effective in resolving those conflicts, even as a leader? All right, um, thank you very much. Um, for the fact that we hold people's money, you know, it's the blood, <laughs> and nobody will come to the bank and you tell the person, you have to come back tomorrow. Mm. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna see it, a, a very meaningful drama at that spot. And another thing is that I manage um, a portfolio that oversees an SME base. So it's a mid-level market and you know how it is in the mid-level. Speed is required. Mm. Now, agitations are bound to happen. And it happens internally. And also you see some exogenous factors pushing it to, in some cases. First and foremost, um, leadership to start with has to be a deliberate act. And in a place like banking, where we have budgets to meet, you must actually be patient as a leader. Else, you are going to run on a lot of people, to be honest with you. And what we do mainly, or what I do, is to ensure that I wear people's hearts. Now, I turn the table around and see why you are reacting the way you are reacting. Now, if I wear your heart, I'll know what is born in you. Let's give, for instance, a fashion entrepreneur and a, um, someone who has actually sought your service. And he comes around and saying, the length of my trouser is short. And what you could say is, but you send the measurement. But the truth of the matter is that you've messed up the trouser. So put yourself first in the position of the man who has sought your service. So when I do that with my team as well, I reason from that angle of, let's give for instance, I expect my guard to know how or where my driver should put my car, but he is not my driver. Now, if my guard knows what I, will, I know, he will be me and not be my guard. So there is a place where training is required. You have to train people and make sure you put them to that expectation 
or that level you want them to know um, what you expect them to get. Now, have you wondered why a katuriara stays at the back? Because leadership is actually serving. You have to lead from the back. And also be ready to take all the insults that will come as a result of that. Now, let me give you an instance. Um, every Monday, I attend management meeting. I probably might not meet my budget. Do you think I should go back to my team with the same tension I receive in that meeting? They probably might resign if I have Gen Zs in my team. Because the next thing they will tell you is the problem will tell you, I'm feeling some aches, um, having some, what do you call it lately? Mental, Mental health. health issue. So you need to actually understand the environment you play in, understand the thought of people, what is making them react, and then wear their hearts to be able to react to well. That's my thought around right. it. Right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. That's very insightful. Um, Steve. Hi, Steve. Hey. Steve, you've trained hundreds, hundreds of leaders and people, um, entrepreneurs, um, you know, organizations. Um, and I just want to ask you um, this, because from everything we're hearing, we cannot separate, you know, leadership from working with people, teamwork. And, you know, in fact, a good manager is one who can manage people. So um, what strategies would you advise a young emerging leader or entrepreneur or creative who's setting up a new outfit, you know, who wants to grow in leadership and management? What, um, you know, tips would you advise or give to help them foster a culture of collaboration and, you know, teamwork and innovation um, amongst team members? So that's a great question. I'd start by saying that leadership is really about raising leaders and not raising followers. So I think sometimes the challenge is a lot of leaders are more focused on being the big dog. They're, you know, they're more focused on being the top dog um, and having everybody else serve them. But the test of true leadership is when you turn your followers into leaders and inevitably um, they work you out of a job. Your job as a leader is to be worked out of position where, you know, previously, let's say you were putting out fires and you were doing this, that, and the other because you've trained and mentored and coached and guided the people in your team. All of a sudden, you start recognizing that you have no more position, so to speak, and the ultimate test of leadership is where you become a coach because the coach stands on the sidelines and watches his, his players play. We never really see you know, Pep Guardiola or Jose Mourinho or whoever your favorite uh, football tactician is get in, you know, you know, you know, um, wear his boots and get a jersey and then run on the field. His job is to create the strategy, the tactics that allow his people to thrive. Now, depending on the scale of your business, maybe you are at the beginning stages, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe you are at the beginning stages of your business and like somebody on stage has already mentioned, um, <clears throat> your job is to lead yourself. Your job is to de uh, de uh, develop discipline and a roadmap for you to be able to follow, to be constantly motivated, even when you don't seem to get the results that you're um, putting in, you put in, put in the work in for accountability and those sorts of things. But where, where it comes to collaboration, I think the most important thing is to first sell a vision as to what the team is trying to achieve. Now, this vision has to be much bigger than you. It's got to be so important that the people in your team, no matter how small your team is, begin to see their future in your vision. Right. Because and a lot of entrepreneurs just talk about where they, as the mm. entrepreneur, wants to go and ditches the people on the team. So the, pe the people on the team have no room in your vision. They don't see where they're going to be. Please allow me to use, the, use this reference. When Jesus was talking about his kingdom and the things he was going to do, his disciples knew that they were going to be in the kingdom. So they would discuss with him and say, when we get into the kingdom, what position would we be? Which is why... I believe it was James and John's mother who came and said, listen, when you get into your kingdom, could we please make sure that one sits at your right hand of authority and the other seat sits at your left? My point is this, until your team recognizes that there's a place for them in your vision, mm. they're not likely to collaborate. So right. That's just a... Wow. 
That's really powerful. That's really powerful. When you were speaking, you talked about the role of leaders to make leaders. So um, a good leader is one who creates another leader and not just a follower. And then it makes me think about the role of mentorship in, you know, in developing leaders and growing leadership skills and managerial abilities. Now, I'd like to ask this question to all the creatives here, Tosin, Dima, and Toju. What role has mentorship, you know, played in helping you grow as a creative? Or you were like, look, I don't have any mentor, I'm self-made. I want to hear those stories. If you were self-made or, you know, you said, you know what, I mean, I'm good at what I'm doing, I'm a creative, I know what I want to do, I'm succeeding at this. Um, but I still need a mentor. And if you found a mentor, we just want to hear those stories and how they helped you um, in developing, you know, a better business process or becoming a better leader or even helping you manage and sharing from their experiences. So I'd like to start with you, Tosin. Um, from a stylist perspective, I mean, when you start, when we started out, we, I mean, the generation ahead of us never gave us the opportunity to come closer and all of that. So you literally had to learn everything on your own. By yourself, wow. And also, yes, like you had to really like self-teach yourself yes. into most of these things. And um, also being the type of person that I am, I... Introvert. <laughs> <laughs> to ask most times, I mean, I'm better now, but to ask for help is almost invincible. Like I'm never going to do that. I'd rather go and search and deep search and do everything I need to do to learn and get what I want. Um, mentorship, I think when I now go to the business part of things, that was, it was right. at that point I knew that, nah, right. you are not going to just take this as a hobby. It's more than a hobby now. Mm. It's a business. Mm. What are you putting your money to do? What are, is your money working for you? All those like tiny, tiny bits. On the reverse side, having to mentor people is a different thing on its own. And I'll tell you why. For me, as much as I feel it's easy breezy, it has taught me to, I'm not a very patient person when it comes to teaching. Like I expect to tell you this and then you get it immediately. But it has taught me to be very patient with people and understand people even more and to be even more open because I'm guarded, I'm very private and all of that. But having to mentor people now is a different thing entirely. It has taught me to be patient. It has taught me to sometimes learn how to also delegate and also learn how to um, be free-minded, be open-minded. Like I said, I'm a very guarded person, but having to do all of these things has really helped me soft pedal, taught me patience, taught me to be a better person as Emotional well. intelligence, basically. Yes, thank you. Um, That's the word. So, I'd like to so do you have any mentors now or do you have any later on? Do I have any mentors now? Yeah, yeah, there are certain people that sort of like guide, like especially the finance part. Of, I see. Especially the finance part of business. Are they in the fashion industry or they're in finance uh, industry? They're or, in finance. Oh, see, I see. They're in finance. So it's very, it's very, and I think I want us to take something away from this. He's in the, in the creative industry. He's in fashion. Um, he's a stylist. But his mentor is bringing something to the table that he knows he's weak at. He's not just, you know, going to follow and I say, I want my mentor to be a stylist or a fashion person. No, his mentor is actually in finance and he's bringing to the table and teaching you something you yes. don't know anything about. So anything Dima, about. please, your experience. Thank you for that, Tosin. Ah, Queen B, say her. I was queen all by myself. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I really have to apologize for Aka and how, <laughs> how annoying he is being. But, um, okay, so... I think that my story is a bit similar to Tosin's in the sense that when I started like doing content creation, like nobody understood what right. that was. It made no absolute because sense. Because we're millennials. Well, you guys are millennials, right? I'm Gen Z. You guys are millennials. You guys, you know. <laughs> yes, you all started in industries that the other generations didn't understand and yeah. didn't know. Yeah. yeah. So I understand that. Yeah. yeah. So like. Around the time, like, because first of all, for me, it really started out as interest in makeup. Like, and the only trajectory that a lot of people around me could understand was like, okay, from this straight to artistry then, 
just you have to go from this to being a makeup artist. And I even had my mom buy me a makeup box because there is no other way that they could see this being monetized or it being anything that could be worthwhile. And then you get into this thing where you're explaining to people that there's actually something called content creation. You can actually make money off of teaching people how to do this thing but not like, okay, so when you say teaching, they'll be like, okay, so you want to start want doing master classes uh-huh. and start doing makeup school. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, then you say, oh, you want to just like put videos out and they'll be like, for free? And then you now have to explain, oh no, that there is another way to monetize it. There's an AdSense way. So basically, for me, when I started this out, really, um, I knew it was possible by just observing people outside of here. So it was like the Jackie Hainas, mm. the Jenny mm. Jenkins, like mm. these people at that point were just doing these things from their living rooms. Um, they weren't even as big as they were now, but I was really inspired by what they were doing. So I'd say that I had people who inspired me and their growth has really affirmed certain things for me. But then I wouldn't say that I had like direct mentorship. Right. Yeah, it wasn't just considering like the, in, the field I was in. It wasn't even something you had access to. Right. And I, that's I think, the, yes, please sorry. continue. No, sorry, carry on. No, continue, please. No, so, and that's the reason why I feel like a lot of creators right now who are dabbling into this, you guys don't know how lucky you are because, like, you have so many real life examples. I didn't even know if this thing was going to be anything that anybody would take to. So, it was a few people here and there maybe asking for more of my work. It was like, I remember my first video that ever went viral. And then I got an email from someone at the Google office. Honestly, I wasn't even sure. I thought it was Kamish a bit. But then I saw that the signature, I looked at the email, I realized it was from Google. Um, it became very, very clear to me at that point, okay, that Google owned YouTube. And at that point, they had realized that this video, because all the videos that were like always going viral, because at that time back in the day, YouTube used to have this like viral page. It doesn't have it anymore. So there is this page that you would see videos like that were viral at a particular location at a given time. And mostly in Nigeria, it was always videos uploaded by foreigners. They realized at a point that that video had been uploaded by a Nigerian IP address or from a Nigerian IP address. And I remember them emailing me saying that they actually wanted me to come into the Google office in Ikoi. And they asked me, they were like, are you based here? I remember how surprised they were because there wasn't really, maybe it was one other person. I think maybe CCME had just moved back but there was really nobody else. So I think it's easier now like for people who are doing this now to have mentors. I've had people approach me for things like that. But for me, I really don't have any story yeah. on mentorship. I had people who influenced me and like I said, who their progress and success affirmed certain things, but I didn't have direct mentorship. No, I think your story is very valid. Um, and I want us to learn two things from what she said. Mentorship doesn't have to be direct or personal. So she's learned from people who she followed. And the truth is, Dima, we saw the growth and we saw how you were learning, soaking up a lot of Jackie Aina, and you learned so much from her. She, of course, was the poster child, number one black, you know, makeup artist, content creator, beauty, you know, content creator in the world on YouTube. She was first, you know, and you're the, you were the first in Nigeria, you know, and, you know, so I, I, I understand that. So something we're learning from that is a mentor doesn't have to be with you personally, doesn't have to be in your room, come to your living room and tell you, get up, ungwa, eat yam before you go to work. So he can't baby you every time. So I think that we, we, we're learning from that. Secondly, um, mentorship isn't always up to down. Mentorship can also be, Across. you know, yes, um, v- horizontal. Because she wasn't as huge as she was now. If it was now, ha, is up to down because she's at the top mm-hmm. and you are down, you know. <laughs> but at the time, she wasn't, no, my queen, you are not down in Jesus' name. <laughs> so, <laughs> at the time, she wasn't as huge as she was. So I want us to go away with learning from that, that a mentor doesn't have to be huge or big or popular. A mentor is just someone who knows what they're doing, knows their craft and is a master in their craft and can learn from them. If you don't know something about something and somebody knows something about that something, they can be a mentor as far as you know, you don't know, you don't know more than they do. So please, Toja, I'd like you to please um, share a story too. Yes. Hello? Sorry. 
Um, I want to add something to what Tosin and Dima have said. I also feel like now, maybe with like social media, there's more willingness to have to be a mentor, if that makes any sense. Right. I feel, I mean, talking from the fashion space now, I, I don't know how open other designers particularly were to even being mentors. Not because of anything, it's just, it was not something that you really do. Nigerians are very secretive people. If you have a business idea or a way of making money, you don't really share that with people, you know? So I think that's just something to add. Yeah. With regards to my personal experience, um, I was just having this conversation with Tosin at the back, actually. I just moved back from Milan. I just moved back from fashion school. And um, I was doing an interview with Genevieve Magazine. Um, and Maya Tafu was still working at my, um, Genevieve Magazine. And so, he, you know, while he was interviewing me, he was asking me, so, you know, you know, fresh from fashion school, what do you want to do, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I want to I do red carpets, and I want to do big events, and I want to do this, and I want to do that, you know? And he said to me, he said, oh, so how's that going to work in Nigeria? Because, you know, we don't, have, we don't have red carpet events. And I was like, what do you mean? You know, because at the time I was working with Tiwa Savage and Tiwa was doing this. and so I, It was like almost like living a deluded life. And he was like, oh, you know, you're going to have to channel that into, so you, you like, you know, evening wear, right? I said, yes. He said, okay, why don't you channel that into like bridal, into this, into that. But I wasn't even trying to hear that. And then of course, you know, when the delusion sort of wiped away, I was like, okay, I don't actually have a business here. I like making clothes, but where's the business side of things? And so I picked up the phone and I called him. I was like, yo, you remember what you said to me about weddings and this and that? And he was like, yeah. And he's like, okay, so this is how you do it. So, you know, obviously you don't have any experience with bridal at the moment. So you start with like bridesmaids dresses and you start with like, you know, events, pieces, maybe birthday dresses. And honestly, that's how he guided me. Into my held your hand. My, honestly, right. I say this every single time. If not for my, I don't think I would be doing wedding dresses wow. today. And so when I had like my show, my first um, fashion, my first bridal fashion show, Maya was there and he was like, yeah, like this is what I knew you could do. And that was such a proud moment for him, I'm sure, but even more so for me that I was able, someone saw something in me and mm -hmm. I was able to mm -hmm. bring it out. Um, and from that point, I just said to myself, if someone could have that effect on me, I wanted to be able to have that same effect on other people. And so, you know, I've done a series of like classes. I do free mentorship. So I have interns. I have free classes, you know, once in a while. Um, and I really, really enjoy that. I remember, once again, back to my first point, which is about people helping people. Um, one of my interns, she was with me for a year, and she started her own bridal. And I posted it on my page, and I was so happy. Mm -hmm. You know, so much joy. Like, this person has learned from me. Like you said, like, building leaders. I was, like, so proud. And that's when people saying, oh, you know, take her off your page. Why would you promote this person? <laughs> Don't you think that people would want to, you know, if Toji is charging 100K for something, they would just go to this person and she would just charge 60K. And I was like, it shouldn't be about that. I can't make everyone's wedding dress. Right. It's not possible. So I'm happy to mentor people. I'm happy that now we have more and more people who are happy to also teach the younger generation because it's, I feel so proud when I look at how far, how far Nigerian fashion has come. It wasn't like this when I first started. Mm. I see some things on Instagram, I'm like, wow. Like, yeah. I'm blown away, and, I'm, yeah. and I've been doing this for such a long yeah. time. So with regards to mentorship, I'm 100% for it and 100% encouraged. Wow. Thank you so much for that, for sharing that, Toju. Thank you. Please put your hands together for these amazing <laughs> panelists. Um, about Abiodu. Okay, it's not my Mac. Okay. So I just want to, you know, go segue into, you know, um, the role of a leader, you know, in staying ahead of trends and ahead of the times. I mean, you had export. Um, I don't know the details of what that looks like, but I just know that from hearing exports, Nigeria is a hugely consumption company, like, like country, you know. But you are heading like a department that should be against the tide and against, you know, the norm. So how do you um, stay ahead of market trends and how do you impute um, market, you know, um, dynamics, what people want, what the trend is, how do you, how does that influence your leadership and decision making in your business or in your office as a right. leader? Thank you so much for the question. It's quite apt. Um, first, I would like to say, just to flow from the discussion, just permit me a bit to just lend a hand. Please. Um, around that, when you speak to mentorship, I think there are two ways to look at it. The abstract part and the tangible part. 
The abstract part is when you learn inadvertently from someone. You don't know you are learning, but you learn. A lot of us learn our languages from our parents. Somehow, they are our mentors, right? Right. Also, in the fashion world, you probably learn from someone. You probably don't know you are patterning your life, if there's a word like that, in the direction of that, part, of that person. But inadvertently, you learn. Mm. So, in the banking industry, we have similar thought process around mentoring. Now, I sit on export business, and it's actually the driving force for this economy at this time. If my mother understands what the value of dollar is today, it speaks to how important it is for anybody to know what is happening in the economy around export. Someone said recently that, of course, there have been interventions here and there, but that's not the lasting solution, except the basic economics kicks in. And what is the basic economics? You export more than you import, essentially. And that is why if you go back to our basic economics again, we were speaking about balance of payment. You know what that is? When you say you export more than your import, is a, sub, is a surplus balance of payment. But when you import more than you export, it is a deficit balance of payment, and that's what Nigeria is facing. So as a driver of this industry, the main thing is you have to get people to love what export business is about. Now, it has different uh, distributaries, so to say. There are different segments. You look at metal part. You look at agribusiness part. It means you must be versatile in all of this. And how do you stay in front? You must be, permit me to use this word, an omnivorous reader. You must be able to consume everything that comes to you. You must read always. Because by reading, you will tap from people's idea. Like, for instance, there is a book about a certain man called Robinson Crusoe. Is a one-man economy, right? In that economy, he does not need money because money is a legal tender. You use it for exchange for goods and services. But if you are a one-man economy, do you need money? Mm. No, you don't. Unfortunately, we don't run a one-man economy. We live with people. We exchange. And that exchange comes to a bigger market to deal with what we are facing in terms of exchange rate. And that is, you must actually see from the expectation level what volume of good we produce, what output of what. And that's now, just imagine I come to your office and you want to export cassava chip. And I speak about the one we're using, making cassava flour. I can't tell you the direction of the market you can take it to. I can't tell you the buyers. I can't tell you the amount it is purchased. That means I have not studied to make myself approved. And then the truth is, a success without a successor is a failure. I expect a situation whereby my followers or my colleagues in the office will be able to do the same thing I would do. If Biodo is not around, they should be able to attend to the same customer, talk to them, and also address the needs of the bank at any point in time. So essentially, that's right. it. Right. Thank you very much. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. As leaders or as emerging leaders, we must learn to read we must learn to stay ahead of the times. Um, but I'll just piggyback off of something I heard you say um, earlier when you talked about leading from behind. Um, Steve, I'd like you to please talk about you know, um, the role of accountability in leadership and you know, managerial skills. I believe that we live in a society where leaders are always trying to be in front and center, and you know um, they don't report to anybody. Um, what is the role, and how can someone cultivate a sense of accountability? And you know, like I said, what's the role? Is it important in you know building a leadership skill or management within a team? Um, how can one cultivate a sense of accountability in ensuring that the teams are you know um, productive? Um, I'd like you to please give us insight about that. Okay, so if I may, if, um, if I may, um, could I just still touch the mentoring thing just a little bit? Please do. Okay, so this particularly is for those who are protégés and are thinking about how do I attract a mentor? Because we've spoken from the mentor down, but I think we need to speak from the protégés up. Um, so people who are watching right now and they see these amazing panelists on stage who have excelled 
in different industries and crafts and you're asking yourself, okay, so what's the first next step? Um, I would suggest that it's not about what you can get from your mentor. It's about what you can give to your Yay. mentor, right? And giving is not particularly very sexy in this day and age where everybody is having some sense of entitlement. You've got to come into the place where you say, you know what, what do I give to this person to get their attention? So I'll, I'll use this example. Um, your mentors, the amazing people on stage are walking in a particular direction. So their eyes are pointed forward. They're moving rapidly towards their goal. Now you as the protege or um, um, uh, aspiring mentee who is way back, uh, so to speak, behind them, you're trying to get their attention. So um, please forgive me, I'm, I'm not sure I got all the names, but can you just give me the name of one person on stage just randomly? Told um, you. you don't mind. Told you. Told you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So Toju. So, you know, somebody sees Toju, she's excelled at her field. I was like, oh, Toju, Toju, excuse me, excuse me, ma'am. Um, please, you know, I'm trying to get your attention. Now, what you're doing in trying to get Toju's attention is that you've become a distraction to her because Toju is moving forward. But in order to attend to you, she needs to go backwards. She needs to turn her head and then either stop for you yeah. to catch up yeah. or she's really nice. She has to walk the distance back to where you are. Mm. And she doesn't have time for that because where she's going is much more important than where you are. So how do you get Toja's attention considering the fact that she's moving forward and she's too busy to look backward? What you've got to do is to be able to say, what's Toja looking at? This requires Woo! you to replace some <laughs> leadership, to come up higher, to say, now it's no longer about me. It's about Toju. What's she looking at? She's looking at world domination in some shape or form, or she's looking at this goal. Now, you've checked her Instagram as an example, or social media, and you can see where she's going. You can, you can kind of plot a graph or a chart as to where she's going. Your job as the protege is to go to where she's going. You need to get in front of her, not behind her. You need to be able to say that I see you're doing this, and I see you're going here. While I may not have this necessary the skills to help you, you know, from a, from a sense of vision, I can make your journey easier or faster. So I'll just give you a very short story to explain this. About 23 years ago, I was in a really dark place in my life. I dropped out of school, um, which is why you can tell how old I am. I, I dropped out of school. I was suicidal, <laughs> depressed. And I met my mentor, still is my mentor, Fela Durutoy. And yeah. Fela took a chance with me. And he, you know, he, he started to guide me, but I needed to get his attention because I had seen Fela at an event such as this, and I was inspired by him. I was enamored with him and I needed to get his attention. I didn't mm. want to be a group because I knew that there were lots of people who, oh, excuse me, sir, can I take a selfie? Can I take a picture? Can I get a card? Can I do with this? I was like, how do I get this man's attention? And I started going to events where I knew that Fela Duratoy was speaking. So if I saw a flyer that he was speaking at, um, I'd go there. Even though he and I did not have a relationship, right, I'd go there. And we didn't really have social media per se, per se. Maybe Facebook was the most important thing. But I knew that this guy was speaking in different places. And I started recognizing that at the time, Fela had a problem that I figured that I could solve. So what was the problem? I would go to places where he had spoken or go to books, the bookstores or different places to say, oh, hey, do you have a Fela Durante book? Do you have a Fela Durante CD? I'd like to get his books. They're like, Fela who? I was like, Fela Durante, you know, have you heard of him? They're like, we don't know who he is. We don't have his books. We don't have this. We don't have that. And then it, it began to dawn on me that he had a message, but he had no merchandise. Woo. And so I said to myself, okay, what if I can help Fela sell or create merchandise? And so the next event that I knew he was going to be, I created a 12-page document as to how I would, and this is, a, this is 2004, as how I would help him sell, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 10 million naira worth of CDs or video contents or so on and so forth. I came up with a plan. Wow. So I, you know, eventually when I met him, and I, I remember saying to him, this is, this is my pitch. It sounds a little arrogant or cocky, but this is my pitch. Um, I got I got in front of him. There were you know other groupies around and stuff. And I said to him, I said, "Oh, hey, um, hi, sir. It's, it's good to see you again." He was like, "Oh, I, I, I recognize you." I was like, "He said, so what's up?" I said, um, "I'm the solution to your problem." He was like, "What?" I said, "I'm the solution to your problem." He said, "What? What's your pro what's my problem?" I said, "You've got a great message, but you have no merchandise because I noticed here that you came to speak and you didn't have anything to sell. I can help you create stuff to sell that you never leave." an event or thing of a jiggy without any merchandise. And that was my pitch, 60 seconds. Long story short, he took me as a volunteer, right? 
I was now within his organization, first as a volunteer, until I worked my way up in the ranks of the organization. So that's just a, a small spiel as to how those of us who are protégés can get the attention of our mentors. I'm so sorry if I'm not able to talk oh about Oh my God, leadership. Steve, that was, that, was, that, was, that was gold. Please put your hands together for Steve. That was next level. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I've learned so much from that, man. Mm -hmm. My staff is here. Hope you are hearing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So please, uh, Steve, yes. Um, finally, before we ask uh, one or two questions from the crowd, we'd just like you to touch on the role of accountability um, and how you can develop a sense of accountability as a leader or emerging leader in your marketplace or in your workplace. I think accountability is so important. So when I coach my clients, I recognize that they're motivated by both pain or pleasure. Everyone is motivated by pain or pleasure. So you're either running towards pleasure or you're running away from pain. Um, if you're running away from pain, you're procrastinating, most, in, most indefinitely. You're procrastinating because you're afraid. Um, you're procrastinating because you're not sure you're good enough. You've got imposter syndrome, so on and so forth. So when I coach my clients and I say to them, look, I want you, tell me what you're trying to do. They tell me, well, let me use Tojo again because I, her name sticks in my head. And Tojo says, well, um, Steve, my goal is to 10x my revenue by December 31, 20, uh, 2024. I'm like, okay, so what is 10x in terms of numbers? So it just says, well, we want to do about 100 million or let's say hypothetically $100,000 by December. I'm like, okay, interesting. Um, what are your goals? So we, we work, you know, I call them smart, you know, strategy, milestones, action, resources, team. I'm not going to go into that. So let's move on. So Tojo now says, oh, she wants to hit $100,000 by December and so on and so forth. We crunch the numbers and I ask her the question, what is, how much is this goal? To you, what's what's it worth to you? If you hit a hundred grand, what what would what would, uh, would it be worth to you? Um, so you says, well, it, it's worth everything. It's visibility, it's influence, it's notoriety, the whole nine yards. I'm like, great. Um, can you put a number in terms of a financial amount? What this is worth to you? If you know, what would you lose if you don't get it? She tells me I'm going to lose a hundred grand. I'm like, okay. What would you gain if you get it? I'll make a hundred grand. Okay. So let's put the let's put how much this is worth to you if it doesn't happen. So just says, what do you mean? I'm like, okay, let's put it this way. If you don't hit this goal by either way or whatever it is, you're going to pay me an amount of money. So just like, what? I'm like, yeah, you're going to pay me for not achieving your goals because you've wasted my time. So Tojo now, so Tojo says, okay, you know what, Steve? Um, if I don't achieve this goal, I'm going to pay you $5,000. I'm like, no, that came up way too easy. $5,000 is too easy for you. Make it harder. Give me money that will pay you. So just says, you know what? If I hit hundred hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars, it's worth it. Steve, I'll give you thirty k if I don't hit it. I'm like, bet. Send me thirty thousand dollars. Put it in my accounts until December thirty one, two thousand and twenty four. Now, what's going to happen is one of two things. Number one, Tuja is going to run away from me because she recognizes that ah, if I don't meet this goal, I'm going to give Steve thirty k just like that. I'm like, yes. Now, the problem why most people don't do that is that there are no consequences for accountability or for the lack of accountability. So whether your goals happen or not, you don't care. No skin off your nose. But if you put consequences to the lack of accountability, all of a sudden there is an economic value to the loss of accomplishments. Because it's like, hmm, should be... Uh, last year you had a bunch of goals you wanted to hit. You never hit them. No skin, no harm, no foul. You don't miss nothing. We'll do it again next year. When you put financial, in my case, when you put financial commitments or consequences to the non-actualization of your goals, all of a sudden you now know what your goal is worth, right? And so I'm going to be praying, even though I'm not, I'm going to be praying that Toju does not hit her goal because if she does, I'm light 30 grand. Toju is going to do everything. She's going to throw the kitchen sink at her goals to make sure she doesn't pay me 30 grand. Now, all of a sudden, Toju has found her motivation. She's no longer, she's, she may not be running towards pleasure, but she's running away from the pain of pain, Steve Harris. And that, as an example, is a one way, one tactic that you can use for accountability. Put consequences that mean something to the individual, right? or the non-accomplishments of their goals. And that's one way to go. Oh my God, please put your hands together again for Steve Harris. And guys, please, I'd like you to please give a better applause for all the panelists here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just give room for one question. We have time for just one question. Do we have a hand? All right, let me have you, first person. 
please stand up so we can get a mic to you. No. Okay. All right, thank you for this um, opportunity. Great. And, um, okay, there, there are differences between um, having a mentor and having a role model. Having a what? Role model. Role model, okay. Okay, I think role model is when you have the person, you don't know the person, um, the person doesn't know you from distance, you're just admiring and all that, following the person's steps and all. But I think the mentorship is where the, my question comes in because they ask of that. I think uh, I'm having an issue with that. Working with or having people that, we, that are ready to work with you, to mentor you, especially when they know you are still on the grassroots, you're not getting to a certain level. Like when you walk down, walk up to them to look like, are you trying to extort from them? I will like, what, 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 like, it's, it's so difficult. So like, um, they answered part of the question, but um, one of the major questions I want to ask is, how can we that are growing try to convince them that we have a goal, we have a vision too, that they, can need, they need to assist us to grow also? to get to their level, because most of them are not ready to, um, to exhaust their knowledge, to look like, are you, do you want to come in competition with them? It's, in the music industry, the people like David Doe's and the likes like that, they, they, they pick up young boys when they see that they're doing one or two things, they show a sign that, yes, I can sing, and they'll pick them up, and they'll groom them, and they'll become famous. But in the fashion industry, or in many other industries, it's very difficult, and I think that's a challenge. So what can we do about that? OK. Um, Abiyotu, would you like to step in for that, please? Mr. Hello? OK. Um, my feedback will be that, um, just taking cue from what Steve mentioned, uh, the pattern at which you actually seek the mentorship matters, which is the first approach. Um, for instance, in the industry which I represent, and also to take you from your own example where you mentioned the music industry. Um, I think in the music industry, it's easy if you are on my record label to actually also make profit out of the trade eventually. However, in fashion, I think we just need to redefine how that can be done, right? Uh, but I think it is a bit different. Um, if I have a label, let's say the Giancola that came here the other time, and then I want to pick you up. You already have your brand name. Uh, would you be ready to work for the Giancola and as a mentor? It's a different ball game, but of course it's a ground which we actually need to um, do a deep dive and then redefine. Now, another approach to it, like in my own sector, uh, it depends on the individual. Um, the individual you meet, and I think most successful business people want to raise followers, honestly. But the fence you see around those people is just a permeable fence. It's just that I will not want you to crowd me. I am working. You need to do export business. But I see 10 people at the same time asking, would you do metal for me? Would you guide me on how to export cassava? Another person is asking on sesame, another person on cocoa, cashew. I can't sit right there and tell you at that moment. You must look for the appropriate time, appropriate angle, an appropriate moment. And also size me up and know what exactly I like. And then you'll be able to get into me and you will see how vulnerable I will be. But it's not something that you have to now say, it has to be momentous. It has to be now. You have to meet me and, and then siphon all the advantage that is associated with export business. You can learn that in one day. And another thing, again, that Steve mentioned, which, I, of course, I want to uh, resonate again, is quid pro quo. You should be able to give something in exchange for the other thing. It shouldn't be a parasitic relationship. It should be both sides. I must be able to see value in you, right? Before I now decide that I'm taking you up. What if I take you up and at the end of the day, I lose my entire business? Just a question from me as the last word. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that. Okay, Dima, please, you can add. Can you guys have? Yes. Oh, okay. Just quickly to add to that, and it's just leaning heavily on what um, Steve um, has said too, is, so like, I actually even didn't know, the first time I actually heard of like mentorship, really, I remember when I was doing my master's degree, this was back in 2014, and I was doing entrepreneurship and innovation at the time, and that was the first time that I actually realized that a lot of like very charismatic people um, in specific industries would um, do paid mentorship, right? Um, they'll say, oh, if you want to gain all these things from me, you could pay, and then I would mentor you, maybe meet two times a month or three times a month. But I also understand completely now how difficult that is for someone who is also starting up and you don't have the financial means. It's just like tying heavily into what Steve has said as well. So, like, I loved the story he told about Fela Durotoye, about like, you know, like the person, you don't want the person looking back and trying to figure out, okay, why are you following me and how do I fit you in and all of that. Like he talked about how he would like look out for flyers, saw places that uh, Mr. Fella was speaking at and then he would show up there and then he figured out by just observing him that Mr. Fella had a problem. And then at a point he now came and he was like, okay, I've identified that you have a problem and I think I can help you um, solve it. And when he said that, it really resonated with me because the first personal assistant I ever had, I didn't, I just knew that I was busy and overwhelmed. And if you were watching my videos, you would have heard me talk about how busy I was. And I remember getting this DM from this babe and she literally broke it down, all the things she could help me do because she also wanted proximity um, to learn like how the thing worked. And she was like, oh, I observed that, oh, you were busy, you wanted, I could help you with scheduling, I could help you with take notes, um, taking notes, sorry. And she was like, oh, you don't even need to pay me. We had a conversation where I was like, okay, I will pay you. I can't afford to pay you a lot, but I will still pay you. But then I think that you're more likely to get someone's attention if they feel like you're going to be adding value to their lives as well. It doesn't now, you know, like, look like they're, like, it's like a burden. So think about it like that and... I feel like everybody has said at this point, be very strategic with your approach. Right, you know? yeah. right. Thank you so much for that, Dima. And finally, just to add to that, I'd like to say something here quickly before we go. Um, Nigerians need to learn to put in the work. A lot of youth and a lot of people right now, let me just even say it plainly, Nigerians are not serious. You need to put in the work. A lot of times, people come to meet me and ask me for this or ask me to do that, and I promise you, if they could have just searched YouTube, they would have found the answer. And when I see stuff like that, it irritates me. So these questions are on the first um, page of Google. Like, you don't even right. need to go to the second or the third sometimes. We, I, I understand what he's saying. So apply so well, yourself. Yes. Apply yeah. yourself, be proactive, put in the work, grow in whatever industry you think you are, you know, you are sent to or you want to do. Put in the work and that's how you begin to generate and build value so that when someone sees you, they don't see you as a liability, they see you as someone who has value. And again, a leader who, if you find people who train leaders or try to build leaders, not followers, leaders, they don't look at someone who they know or think that if they pour into, it will be like they're pouring water into baskets. Mm -hmm. I don't want to pour water into a basket. Mm -hmm. I want to know that when I'm pouring into this person or putting seed, it's growing. When I give you feedback, when I give you leadership, you know, advice, I want to see you apply and then grow. Before you, I now get the place where I'm comfortable to put, invest more in you again. So please, if you're here, try and apply yourself. Put in the work, grow. And again, let me say this final thing. Nobody owes you mentorship. Nobody owes you a damn thing. All right? You have the power and the rights and every agency to create something of yourself by yourself. If you learn, all the resources you have or need are available right now. I mean, AI is here. We are talking, there's Google. Google has been there and now we're moving to AI. You have all the resources available. You have stories of people online, the people who you think are your role models or mentors, all of their stories, and you know, it's all online. Learn from people before you get to a place where you think you deserve mentorship or direct mentorship, or you think someone should invest in you. Nobody owes you that. Put in the work, 
and apply yourself, you know. But I think we've come to the end of this. Thank you. Ungwa, put your hands together for me now. <laughs> but thank you to all my panelists. Thank you so much, Tosin. Thank you, Dima. Thank you, Toju. Thank you, Abiodun. And thank you, Steve. We appreciate you and thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you very much. All right, guys. I think we've come to the end of this. I think we can just stand up and maybe take a photo.